Welcome to Cube3. Uh, I'm Sandy, and this is... Andy Santos. The director of Poltergeist. That's correct. So, I've got a few questions for you. Sure so, thing. just answer them as candidly as you want. <laughs> um, how did you come to be the director of Poltergeist? Yeah, so, as I was saying, uh, Poltergeist is um, the results of a, a prototype initi initiative that we had at the company called Pronto Protos, and the, the team itself did a whole bunch of prototypes, and this was the one that was uh, selected. So at the time, it didn't have this uh, sort of supernatural look or feel. It was just spheres and cubes, and uh, basically yeah, you played as a sphere running away from a big cube that became eventually the monster that we have in the game today. So it started off very, very prototype. Yeah, very, very much a prototype, and um, uh, me and the CEO of the company, we sort of grew up uh, playing games like Gauntlet, yeah. Uh, on the old systems and in games like that you would have moments where you go around a dungeon you unlock a door and then this sort of monster of death was released and then you'd be arguing amongst yourself going who did that who did that and we wanted a game that that kind of brought that back yeah and you know a game where you could kind of mess around with your friends sometimes good sometimes bad <laughs> and you could fall out with one another whilst you're playing a game and basically, that's that's what we did. So we started talking, we started developing the, the idea. Uh, we have this kind of form follows function approach, and we started to add the, the form uh, that you see today when we took those spheres, we made them into little ghosts, and I'm like, can we put the ghosts into objects? Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> it started, started to bring things to life. And then the monster itself is kind of like death from Gauntlet. I don't know if this is bringing on a lawsuit or something, but... <laughs> He, you know, the, he, he's got red eyes and he's he's black. Yeah, the monster. So, uh, not like the, the the little enemy in in Gauntlet. With with the sort of building up of the the idea, of what was your sort of favorite um, growth or new feature or well, there's, expansion there's so, of that there's original so many, idea? There's so many of them. Um, you see, it, because it's a, it's a team thing. The team just try things out, and we don't sort of control it. So when you're working in AAA, you have to be very controlled because you're spending so much money. Whereas on this team, you know, a coder can, or any team member can come up with an idea hmm. and go, what about this? So if you play the build today, there's like a, there's like a gumball um, and you can collect that and then use it and fire it at somebody and it, it takes them with the shot. And if it hits a wall, they get stuck to a wall, right? So that, that came out of somebody just decided to do it one day and spent a day on it and then we found out about it in the meeting and then the CEO who's, who's behind you he has to like green light should we spend more time on it he's like what the hell in this case let's just do it so it's it's very um, organic how it's evolved it maybe too organic um, and, and for me it's it's incredibly liberating because when you're working on I don't know a Horizon game or Resident Evil game or Skate or something like that you've got so many people the burn rate is so huge you have to make sure you, you're going through feature by feature and they're prioritized whereas whereas this game if somebody has a great idea we're gonna put it in <laughs> yeah and i mean with some of those bigger games as well you've got that big publisher sitting on your shoulders going that can't happen so exactly exactly you don't we, have that this yeah time. yeah we don't have that at the moment we don't have a publisher so if you want to publish the game get in touch with us but um at the moment, we don't have that publisher, so we, you know, basically we control our own finances. So, basically, it's shall we do this? <laughs> Is it worth spending a day or two? Probably. We're going to get results, and it's going to be fun. Excellent. So basically, it's a lot of fun working on this. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, and um, especially it, it's also very serendipitous because uh, you know me and my my boss over there. We went to the same school, and we want to make video games together in school. And so it's great to be able to do that professionally. You know, it's it's like the fulfillment of a dream. It's really weird as well, because when, when we were younger, I was probably the programmer, and he was more the creative guy, you know, even though he's the great, one of the creative forces behind yeah, this. But my, my group was totally game design. He went down a coding group working on Sleeping Dogs and Call of Duty and games like that. So we, we have a very sort of complementary skill set. And, the team is like that as well. The team wears many hats. And our, our concept artist is in Finland, so a lot of ideas start there. Yeah. <laughs> and then we come online an hour later and we're like, yo, that's cool. <laughs> no, no 
but it's really it's quite interesting that both of you have worked on these like big franchises. So you got Horizon, Resident Evil, yeah. Call of Duty, <laughs> and uh, all this, and now you're indie developer, just like that. It, yeah, it's, it's it's quite crazy, isn't it? And it's not related to anything we've worked on as well, you know. So it's not like has Escape Four <laughs> or another Call of Duty. Yeah, that that's um, what I like about it. You know, it's maybe a bit unexpected if you look at uh, our back uh, catalog of games, but still fun nonetheless, you know. Yeah, definitely. Arguably more fun by the sound of things. Well, yeah, it's the first game I can play with my kids, so they couldn't play Resident <laughs> Evil. So, yeah, they're, they're twi twins and teens, and um, they like playing it, and the team likes playing it. And we took the game to EGX, and uh, we had about 700 people play the game. And we did a survey at EGX, mm. and about 100 people answered to that survey. And the largest age group playing this game was over 35s, which is kind of surprising so we've got a game that really works for all ages which you know if you go back to triple a again you need to pitch to an audience yeah and if i went into a, a boardroom and said hey, this game is for all ages i get left out with um the sort of wide audience yes. uh, you've gained does that influence your approach to accessibility in games uh totally um it's it's really interesting because uh, prior to this um, event we had like um, we were trying out some ideas and we put in a new hub and then I had to write up how to play the, the game and it, it was like a four page document so I'm like go here take a left jump on the arcade machine activate the arcade machine choose play online you know uh, so if you think about it today you can just literally start playing the game uh, we intro the game with a monster so the objective should be quite clear from that you know it's like three two one run yep. <laughs> And so, yeah, we were just talking, um, I was talking with G um, Jim Bagley. Um, old school games, you didn't need to have tutorials because the objective was really clear. And that's what we're trying to do with this game. Um, you know, it's the monsters versus the ghosts and you, you, you play the ghosts. It's, it's that simple. Um, the controls, we're still working on them and refining them. But we, the, the game is a couch co-op game too. So that means we have to design for the little non-shock controller for the Switch, for example. So it's super simple. You're talking about, you know, choosing a direction. We've got boost control. We have a, a button for abilities. And that's it, really. Although in this build, specifically, you can um, maneuver the camera. So there could be, a, you know, like a change of camera for the, the Switch version and the couch co-op to make it um, even less, uh, you know, less... Um, Commands on it, input, if that makes sense. So yeah, it gets even more simple. But yeah, we, we have to make sure that like I, I have a really good tester. My 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 youngest daughter, seven, she can play the game, so she can keep playing the game. We're in a good space, right? Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so you mentioned Switch and yeah. uh, things. Have you got a, have you got a release lined up for all the platforms, or uh, are you just going for Steam to begin with? You know, this is the, the what if question. Um, at, the, at the moment, we are looking for a publisher, so we are speaking to publishers right now. If we self-publish, we're aiming for uh, Halloween as a release yeah. date, uh, <laughs> which makes sense for the theme. Exactly. You know, we got terrifying monster, super terrifying. It's not really, um, but yeah, Halloween would be a, a good spot to, for us to launch. Um, if we got a publisher, we'd want to enrich the feature set, so it'd be probably early in the next year. Um, if we're launching ourselves, it'll be on PC first, and then hopefully we'll we'll get an audience and then port over to um, different consoles. Midorium, the com uh, company that makes this that I'm part of, um, they actually specialise in ports so and co-development. So the last games were Hello Neighbor 2 mm -hmm. and The Pathless, um, which we brought to Xbox and and the switch so yeah the switch already works uh, we test it you know at home on the switch so hopefully yep. it'll be so on you just, platforms. just need the the final push to get it out yeah, there yeah. The, the, the cash yeah. <laughs> the marketing uh, of, well I that's what we need i i mean i can't see it not getting an audience it does look like a lot of fun yeah it's, it's interesting we, there's a few things in the pipeline we have a hollywood actor that is gonna voice uh letty on the strength of the franchise itself so that's kind of cool, you know, to present something to a Hollywood actor and then to go, yeah, I'll, I'll be part of this. Um, there's somebody that's interested in making an animated feature from this as well, which is really cool. That's so we've really made, cool. yeah, we've got, we're working with a Netflix artist right now on an animatic. And that sort of shows off the animation 
uh, quality that this, this game can have. Um, so it's, it's really cool. We have some interplay between these two key characters, Letty and Hump. It's made by the, uh, the artist in, uh, in Finland. Um, she devised these two characters and they've become our key characters. Um, and it's really about them trying to find the objects that you, you have in the game that, we, that they use as armor. Hmm. So the, the idea is the objects are armor, but ob objects also have physical properties. So in the final game, not in this build, but in the final game, that means if you go into a, an inflatable object, you can float on water. If you go into a heavy object, you'll be able to sink under the water, things like that. So, um, but in the animation, they're, they're, they're just frenzied. They're trying to get, you know, armor before the monster enters the room and then knock, knock somebody at the door and it's a big bad monster. Thank you very much for talking to us no, today. No, thank you. Um, and obviously, best of luck with your launch of Ultra Guys. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. Hopefully, it'll, it'll you know <laughs> go out on TV. You'll see Polter Guys everywhere. I'm like Polter Guys plushies. They'll be, be the new Fall Guys. Oh wait. <laughs>